Great to have you all back for another episode of Think Tech for Wise Human Humane Architecture. Uh, me, your host, Martin Despang, is broadcasting live from the city of Würzburg, which is the most northern part of the most southern state here in Germany of Bavaria. It's about 10 p.m. here. You can hear the bell tower ringing over there. It should be done soon. So last show, we concluded uh, saying we're either going to do our uh, European Hawaii Madeira again, or we're going to do another of our automobile architecture episodes. And um, the ones discussing that with and doing these are the Soto Brown Bishop Museums, historian and archivist who got called by the museum and therefore can't be with us uh, today. And our other uh, third one from the filling station uh, architect, Ronald Lindgren, is still dealing with his uh, flooding, his internal flooding in his uh, Killingsworth inspired house, uh, who was his uh, business partner and friend. So uh, I'm on my own today, but uh, I talked through this with them before, so I will also squeeze in things on behalf of them. So uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to start out not with either or, but as well as, and the first slide up, please, um, is going to be um, cars. So um, we're back on Madeira, although uh, the top row there is actually from Spain. I just got back from our cross-cultural uh, culinary connoisseurs, uh, Joey and Clara, who have moved to Barcelona in Spain, Catalonia to be specific as the Catalonians uh, like to hear it. And so uh, the top one here um, is a uh, car that's very common in Madeira, but uh, we forgot to snap a really good one. So I made up for that and um, got, got this one here. It's the Renault uh, Quatre, which means four, number four. And that's a car that's very much sort of like the, the sibling, the brother or sister of the Citroën de Chevaux that we've been talking about a lot in the past in the automobile show. Uh, uh, Lenny, my son, is coming to visit me uh, with his Citroën uh, DS3 on Monday. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, the DS3 is our investigating mobile when I'm back in my Hanover hometown and where we uh, checked out a 70s courtyard house. And we saw one of these very rare uh, Renault Fords, which you hardly ever see in Germany anymore. But they're around quite a lot, uh, not too much, but still you see them. Uh, the one at the very top right is... Uh, looking at the uh, Renault 4 as a brother because their, their front grille looks very similar. This is a new car. This is the Honda e prototype uh, that la Honda launched uh, back uh, in Japan and in Europe. It's a fully electric car and they say it's inspired by actually the, the first Honda Civic. However, that front grille looked a little different, had sort of this meandering kind of uh, notching there. So I thought when I saw it, hey, this reminds me of the Renault 4 uh, a lot. So um, the, the bottom cars, the four bottom cars are actually from, from Malta. And uh, there are, you know, some new cars out there as our uh, Renault Megane that you see us at the filling station there at the middle right. But the car next to it, in front of it, is a very legendary car that's a Lancia, designed by the legendary and most versatile and most inclusive, as I like to add, and I forgot to say that, so I can say it now, um, relative to Ron, where, um, you know, uh, what, what Ron told us that Ed was really one of his favorite projects was basically for um, Latin American, uh, you know, working class people and to, to give them housing and de decency and dignity, which he wasn't able to accomplish, uh, unfortunately, because they were very successful in resort design and, and rightly so. Jujara kind of reminds me of Jujara because Jujara did, uh, you know, what impressed Iran basically a lot. Um, basically, um, the, um, you know, he designed um, you know, many things, many hot cars, as for example, the, um, the M1 uh, BMW and the uh, DeLorean from Back to the Future. But he did very simple cars as uh, the Soto Ur 
uh, first golf and uh, the Fiat Panda. And he's designed this one here. Rally fans are very fond of this one because it's a very legendary car that also drove in rallies. This is our 200, happens to be our 205th show. And 205 is also the, uh, the, the, the name of the model of the Peugeot, which is the one to the left in, in the middle at the left row. Uh, this is a car that's been very popular, and there are few around uh, here in, in Germany, but uh, Portugal uh, doesn't have an own car brand, uh, uh, but it's a place for car manufacturing, for other car manufacturers quite a bit. So, um, you know, this is the Mediterranean area, so like the fellow Mediterranean car manufacturers of the French um, are around quite a bit. But also the bottom row, um, that is to the very bottom left, is the Mercedes 190. The nickname is the Baby Benz because it was the smallest Mercedes that they did at that time. And they still, it's now the C class. That's one that's a very legendary car. They were built to last and they're still around even in Germany. Joey was once looking into one back then. And um, they're, they're in pretty good shape uh, over there. It's an island again, there's a lot of sea salt. But they're around, uh, they take care of their cars. And the one at the very bottom right, the Soto and I talked a lot because I said, you're probably not familiar with that one. He said, no, 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 I know them very well. This is a Fort Capri and Talking Islands. This is obviously named after an Italian island. And uh, this has been manufactured by the German branch of the Ford American Motor Company and then sort of got exported or from the point of view of Americans got imported uh, so, so it's been, it's been known over there too. So, um, again, uh, why are we talking about cars? What's the relationship of cars and architecture here again? It's like, it's not that there aren't any at all fancy cars. And there's certainly every now and then you see a larger, you know, limousine, but there's a lot of small cars, uh, for the future. There's an oddity we read. We're still puzzled about it. There's a projection that there might not be small cars in the future anymore because due to higher emission standards, um, the, uh, the, the profit margin basically supposedly um, you know, is smaller in, in smaller cars. And, um, and it's, a, it's a larger effort to, to bump it up to the, to the uh, energy efficiency standards. So they're saying that way, the small cars might not be profitable anymore. So the car manufacturers might stop doing them. We hope this is not true because it's sort of an irony, right? I mean, like, you know, the small car is the, the tiny house equivalent in architecture. And to say a tiny house is not, you know, cost efficiently to do is kind of absurd. So hopefully that, that is not true. And again, you see the Honda e prototype up there that obviously tries to make that work. So let's go to the next slide because talking old cars um, in, in Madeira as being part of Portugal. Here we see an old house in Madeira. Madeira is politically part of Portugal. Portugal has been in an, has been an authoritarian uh, dictatorship or, you know, uh, until the uh, mid seventies. And only uh, 10 years later, a decade later, it became part of the European Union. And even then it took them a while to basically, you know, get funding and support from the other European countries. So you still see, like you see old cars, you see old houses there. And uh, that's a good thing. And the European Union is, um, by the way, uh, the president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, has just announced a few days ago that she sets the goal of 2035 when the fossil combustion engine should be off the table uh, in the European Union. So only electric cars or other, you know, systems should be allowed and the, the, the very sort of polluting combustion engine should be uh, then the pest. So we will see how that works. Honda, by the way, announced along these lines, they're aiming for uh, even a decade earlier, um, 2025, which is, which is very soon. So we, we look forward to that one. And why is that important for architecture as well as for automobiles? We've been talking that the Cash for Clunker program, which came from Germany, the Abwrackprämie was pretty much a, a sales pitch by the car industry 
because until you produce a car entirely with fossil fuel, which we're far away from, uh, it's more ecological to drive your old vehicle as long as you can. And especially if you have small cars with smaller engine, that's even more the case. And that is true for architecture as well. That's one of the other agendas that the European Union puts out. Uh, there's an increased awareness of um, that we should take care of the existing building stock and put that you know, up to pace to, to current standards uh, as well as energy efficiency standards. Because the carbon footprint that had been put into a building, you need to get that out of it. Or in best case, they've been built so many hundred years ago that they were basically pre-fossil because there were no power tools in place. So there's, here's an old house in, uh, we've been uh, sitting in the central pedestrian uh, uh, street last show uh, and had some nice dinner. This is only a few houses away from that one. You can see, you know, when you look very close at the very top middle image, uh, you can see the louvers and you see something shining through it. There's no light on there. I, I tell you, I swear you, it's actually hollow. And you see, you know, there's, there was an artist movement of, you know, an, an initiative to, you know, have everyone paint the door in uh, certain different ways and just attempts to, you know, make the buildings look prettier than they are. And again, um, this is still the aftermath of that uh, totalitarian regime that they have and, uh, you know, takes a long time reminds uh, me of our east side of Germany, which is still catching up uh, from their totalitarian regime. And there are some remote areas where buildings uh, look like that a lot. And from DeSoto, I, I said it reminded him, and we're still finding connections. And we said we almost could have met around Elvis back in the early 90s, which was my year in uh, college in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I did a trip up to Graceland and in Tennessee, uh, and he did too. So we could have met there. And he found some houses in that area and some rather poor neighborhoods where they basically had kept the facades as fake fronts and, you know, basically not want to reveal that it was basically hollow and, you know, basically, um, you know, slum behind. So next slide. Next slide, we, we thought this is really very characteristic and, and typical for that shift of uh, Portugal, of still the older generation. There's this gentleman there to the left, older gentleman, you know, bending over still with a, with a brush and a broom, uh, basically cleaning the streets. Um, and then you see on the right side, a fancy restaurant where we wanted to have a drink, but the waiting line was too long. And that fancy electric, you know, I3 Beamer there stands for the next generation. The first city I ever uh, got in touch with on the mainland of Portugal was Coimbra, which is in, inland, it's not on the, on the ocean. And uh, you could see very well that the older generation, some of them are still living in these very sort of medieval cities with very, in a very primitive way. Uh, without many of the amenities that you know you run are suffering from now running water and electricity and stuff like that. And you see the new generation who have been lucky or not, depending on how look at it, uh, to sort of become successful in capitalism and you know drive fancy cars and, and things like that. So you see these clashing into each other or having this sort of kind of weird. Uh, coexistence, as you can see on, on this slide here. Uh, our exotic escapism expert, Suzanne, knows that very well because at her sweet 16 age, when she left home and wanted to uh, get a taste of Portugal, she lived in Porto, which is you know, further north from Coimbra, northwest on the coast. Uh, she, uh, you know, even lived that. I just visited, but she lived in families and new families who where this was all happening. So uh, speaking of Suzanne, next slide. Uh, this is on our honeymoon hopping here. We you know, had, had some good time and um, I quizzed the soda and I said, you know, where is that? And he said, well, that certainly looks like, you know, you, you had a good time in a nice resort and it truly looks like that. But in fact, the point we wanna make about this one here, this is public, this is public space. This is in some small town on the coast. There's a restaurant, 
but the pools down there are public pools. In fact, local people were just repainting the pool and, you know, uh, to me, the paint didn't look dry yet, but they already, you know, filled it up with water again and the kids were, were going there and having fun. So that's something that, that we said we would like to see, you know, in, 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 in Honolulu more or in Hawaii more. Reminds us of Lawrence Halprin's great Cala Fountain in Portland, where our uh, Tropic Year number one, David Rockwood is from, right? Public spaces for the, for the little people. We're not talking resorts. We're not talking egalitarian uh, you know, circles. We're talking egalitarian circles for all the people. And that's basically happening here. So that's something we want to throw out for consideration for us, for us back in Hawaii. Uh, next slide is talking architecture. So what's the best architecture? You know, here back in Germany, it's, it's wall architecture. It's summer right now, uh, but it's gonna be winter at some point sooner than many wish here and you need walls. In Hawaii and in Madeira, Europe's Hawaii, we basically need um, roof architecture. And, and this is one of the best pieces of architecture that, that crossed my path here, which is just a tent. And that reminds us of our guest, Larry Medlin, that we've been doing many shows, who's been doing just that with his collaborator and partner in crime, Fry Otto. And he has been doing, you know, tents that were just like the one here in Meridera that were uh, opaque. And, you know, they let this, or, or translucent, but they weren't transparent. They let the light through, but they keep the sun out. And that's what you want. Uh, while in Germany, back at the very top left is our wilderness wedding, where we got these transparent umbrellas to, you know, protect us from the at, time, at that time really, really chilly rain. And I went back with this umbrella to Prados uh, um, 72 uh, Munich Olympics, which reminds me a lot of the acrylic plates he basically used to cover it up because again, there isn't so much the need here to uh, shade it because there's only a few months where we have the sun being so intense. But, you know, in winter time, the sun is, is more than welcome and it, it can keep you warm. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, doesn't this look like back in Hawaii? Very much so. So we said the geology and the scenery, you know, the landscape is very much the same. This is high up in the mountains. And you see these sort of paths there um, they look like roads, but they're actually uh, water lines and they're called levadas. And something is really the same. There is actually a windward side and a leeward side. And the windward side is the wet side as well, where there's a lot of rain. And the other side, the southern part, is just like our southern part in Waikiki. You know, I sometimes, you know, don't have any rain for weeks or for months. And that's the same here. Uh, they were basically then building some pretty massive infrastructure of these sort of waterways that they were like cutting through the jungle. And they have these, you know, they have these little rivers that basically help to bring the water that's necessary for life, both for uh, farming, for irrigation and for drinking. And they basically bring this um, to that drier southern side. Uh, the very top image is a show quote from... Um, top left is the river of Izar that runs through Munich. Um, talking um, water and flooding, you probably are wondering if we got hit by some of the terrible floodings with many hundreds being killed in Germany here. You have the same in China. We're safe, but again, many people are not. And so we pray for them and wish them all the best. And you know, more importantly, and as importantly, we should do anything and everything we can do in the future. So to prevent these things, nature is getting angry at us, rightly so, because we've not been treating her as well as we should have been. So we got to stop doing that and, and do better. Uh, the Isa was not quite as, you know, overflowing as other rivers. And so, but, but pretty high too. So, um, Water is, um, you know, is not just indoor flooding for Ron, but it's outdoor flooding currently um, really, really a lot. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, very high up in the mountains, then at the top of the mountains is something that we've been referring to in a show back then about our volcanic veneer and 
ventilation where we pointed out the uh, island of El Hierro, and that's part of the Canarian Islands, and that's actually not that far away from Madeira. It's the next kind of uh, part of that um, uh, geographical area of the Macaronesia, as it's called, and it's just south of, of Madeira, and it's a volcanic nature as well. And we've been, you know, talking about that there was this very brave engineer who over you know, decades has been relentless to basically put the island off the grid by using hydroelectric power. And he's been, they've been building these big r r reservoirs up in the mountains and then let the water run down um, and, and, you know, harvest energy that way. And you can see the same thing here at the top of the mountains in Madeira here, where there's this big water reservoir and then there's a laveda coming out of it. Bottom left, you see uh, also there's water running on the sides of the streets and in front of the um, the houses there, which is something very scenic. It reminds me of Paris, where you have constantly water running, um, you know, on the side of the the street and the walkways. You know, makes some beautiful noise, and you know, it's so clear and crisp that I'm I'm pretty sure you can you might even be able to drink that. Next slide. Um, where does the water come from? Basically from the mountains. This is where the clouds run into the higher elevations and they weep and become rain. And uh, you drive through this rainforest, which is the, uh, the laurel forest that we talked about last time. And it's really sort of beautiful. Um, you can't, this is a little different, right? And there's a lot of hiking in Hawaii where you can sort of hike through the high elevations, but uh, not so much drive through that, which is probably good. But here there is actually roads. And these are the old roads. Before they were doing this sort of massive tunnel infrastructure they've been looking into last time. And next slide is when you get out of the jungle down in the lower elevations, you see how severely mankind has been interacting and interfering, you have to say, you know, with with the forest, with the rainforest, and see how many, you know, buildings you see there. This reminds us a lot of 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 you know Oahu and, and Honolulu, which which makes you wonder. There was a, a an old magazine from the 60s that had a title story that was saying Paradise and Pearl. And that was back in the 60s. And obviously things haven't really improved since then. The opposite. Next slide. So this is what happens then. This is really sad to see. Uh, this is the smell like really eucalyptus trees. So I'm sure the one on the left might be a eucalyptus tree. And they're clearing the forest, and you're wondering for what. And it's probably for for inhabitation. And again, as we said last time, the uh, name Madeira is basically Portuguese for wood. And so if they keep going like that, they got to rename their island or that's, you know, because there might not be enough um, wood left, forest left to basically justify that name. Next slide. Obviously, as, as an architect, you know, I'm sort of have a conflict of interest because that's our discipline and profession. So, you know, we've been spotting, you know, these pieces of modern architecture, uh, you know, the one at the top right and the bottom one, surely nice pieces, you know, this is, this is nice. Um, you know, the, the kind of the Honda E was sort of like a retro, um, you know, this is purely not retro, this is modernism that sort of self invents itself. You see they're using a lot of the vernacular themes of courtyards and open spaces and, and roof architecture. They're honest in their materiality, but they're all coastal, right? So architecturally, you know, yes, but typologically, single family residences, you can call them McMansions. They're, you know, they're just not right there, right? They're just basically uh, sort of a, a territorialization in, in a way and, um, and just taking away from the the character of of the island that should be left more more natural and not be sort of getting these measles even though these are nice ones but 
again, if, if you do too many of these, you just ruin, ruin the character. Talking character, and again, next slide. Climatically, we've been talking about the, the one at the bottom is, is the one just next door, just under construction to the one from the last slide at the bottom. Uh, we have this sort of weird obsession with saying, oh, we want to stop there. And we basically want to inhabit the ruins because, I mean, that's basically what you need. And you can then have your sort of more softer infill or enclosure uh, being sort of separated. The ones at the top, you hardly see in Hawaii because the cost of, you know, land and the islands being so precious. And so whenever there's, there's land, you know, people are going to either not build on it and, mostly keep speculating uh, until it gets even more expensive and they can make a bigger buck or they build and then immediately move in or they rent it out or whatever they do. But these are sort of incompleted buildings. These are like ruins. And I, I thought these are really kind of nice sort of Mesian or Prouvé pavilions that I would love to have them, you know, been moved in and having, you know, suburban nomads you know, throw up their tents in them. Because again, they provide already what you need. Uh, just like the same in Hawaii, similarity. Most time of the year is shelter just from the sun and the rain, but you don't need any walls and they don't, they don't have that. Uh, next slide um, is uh, pretty much us looking for where we wanted to honeymoon. And so we went, you know, online and shop for places. And this was one that appealed to us, had very good reviews, called the Sat Charum. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. And, you know, it reminded us, these are the show quotes in the top right of the Makaha or the Ihilani back then by Ron's partner, business partner, uh, Larry Stricker, which is a nice project. Location-wise, it's rather remote. So this one here is also, you know, way out west. Same thing. And they, you know, the consideration was just like at the, the Makaha apartments to not have this be in an eyesore and being on top of the hill or the mountain, but basically been at the foothills of it and almost being tucked into it. So that's something, you know, honorable, we thought. Kind of camouflaging the mass. And you can see this is rather a lot. There's a lot of rooms in there. Uh, but we decided to not do it. It was also, you know, seemed a little bit too hip, uh, didn't feel right for us. Um, and, but, but still, you know, architecturally and, and from kind of the, the strategy of, of, you know, trying to nest it into the landscape. But again, we thought, you know, if you do this too much, if you do this a lot, you're still gonna, you know, do too much uh, more than the island sort of could handle. So we decided, not to stay there and where we then decided to stay we're going to tell you next week or next time uh, hopefully our two others from the filling station DeSoto and Ron are going to be back and we're going to decide if we're going to do another one of our auto architecture or if we're going to continue and then let you know at which place we stayed which we very much want to share with you and that we can learn a lot from that back for Hawaii. So with that, um, thank you and see you all next week and stay, um, you know, try to adopt the modern mindset a little bit more because there's a lot to learn from. Bye bye.